This week on Storyboard, Royal Enfield's Rudra Teet Singh speaks about the biking brand's new aggressive avatar. Under considerations, arm in which harps on the importance of communicating the benefits of good design to the marketers. And Micromax gets two interesting faces to highlight product benefits in a new campaign. Hello and welcome to Storyboard. I'm Shubani Gharat. Now, love for biking has taken a new meaning in India. Hitting the national highways, taking on the Western Ghats, or riding the Manali Leh route have become the ideal long weekend plans for enthusiasts. And such enthusiasm ought to turn on the ignition for a company like Royal Enfield. Storyboard editor Anand Rangaswamy caught up with Royal Enfield's president Rudra Teet Singh on the sidelines of the Brand Z Summit and spoke to him on how the company is getting aggressive and capitalizing on the growing customer preference. For leisure biking. To begin with, now in this new avatar of you know the aggressive Royal Enfield, mm -hmm. uh, how, how are you enjoying the game? Well, uh, the new avatar has taken a lot of doing. I mean, it sounds like uh, you know we we uh, our success is well documented. We are we are growing very well. We are doing our mine measures are even higher than our market share. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, there's a lot of fundamental hard work that's gone into getting this done in the last five years. Our products have improved significantly. Um, our focus on what we are all about, our fundamental belief has become much clearer. Uh, and uh, what we have been able to overcome is basically some of the triggers and barriers that were earlier there on people not being able to motorcycle. Uh, and Royal Enfield has been able to unlock that. That's really been the been the game. And there's, there's been a lot of work at the backstage to see the kind of front stage success that Royal Enfield is currently enjoying. All right. A part of this, uh, say, the new new era of the new avatar is you're investing heavily in retail and retail experiences. So let my viewers understand a why you're doing that, and uh, what do you hope to get out of it. Look, it's very clear for us that uh, we have momentum behind us and for us to be able to retain that momentum will require uh, winning in certain moments of truth which are absolutely pivotal and I would just summarize them to three. The first is uh, instead of doing awareness for our brand, which we don't do, we don't do talk, you know, uh, above the line advertising, but we, we want to be the best people to be able to reach and invite intenders into our store. That's our first sort of expertise that we want to build. We want to make sure that our team, and it's not necessarily a marketing team, but a managing and inviting intenders team figures that out really well. I think that's the first moment of truth. The second moment of truth is making sure that the in-store moment, when a person takes out time and steps into our stores, then that experience is in line with the promise we made. And the third moment of truth is for us in use. So intention, in-store, in use. The product needs to deliver. This aftermarket service needs to deliver. If all of these three ins, in that sense, manage are managed well and we are authentic about uh, our promise, uh, we will not need to advertise. The influence itself uh, will 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 do the will do the work for us. That's exactly what's been happening for the last five years. The retail strategy is nothing but an offshoot of that. We want to make sure that we significantly. Uh, we are significantly better than anyone else and our own standards uh, in terms of inviting intenders to test our motorcycles, making sure that the experience in store, whether it is for our motorcycle test rides, whether it is for our gear and accessories and apparel that we've now brought uh, to life, uh, or the moment of truth which is in use, where the product needs to deliver. Finally, you know, the, the pr product has to do what it says. Uh, all three will ensure that there is a very strong involvement and influence and our real GRPs are people who are riding our motorcycles. Uh, how do you measure ROI in something like this? You know? you be no, because real estate is a complex yeah. uh, measurement. So well, we have, uh, we have business heads for our, uh, for our gear business. We have unique um, exclusive gear stores. We've got six already in India. Uh, we sell our gear globally uh, in very, very exclusive um, locations where we also sell our motorcycles. Uh, the ROI is a combination of the motorcycles we sell through these stores as well as the gear we sell through these stores. L also, the other interesting part of the ROI, for example, we've launched a, a flagship store for gear in Khan Market a few months back. Uh, the purpose 
for us being there in Khan market is not only is it obviously a sales and an experience point, but it gives a huge opportunity to see uh, for people who are the right kind of people who frequent footfalls into that uh, that market. We don't do outdoor hoardings, but we our store itself is one strong visibility mechanism for us to make our presence felt. Sure. Well, you know, one of the challenges for you is, you know, there's so much of this sort of uh, circle that you're describing, which is controlled and owned by you. Yeah. And then there's an elements which are not. Yes. For example, service centers and so on. How do you give uh, experience, look, see, feel, uh, consistency across the, those? Yeah, so we uh, all are... Uh, and by the end of the year in India, we will have 500 dealerships, which will be um, company run or through dealers, right? So the combination of that. Uh, these will, all of them will have the, what we call the three S, which is sales, service and spare. So that is a very, very, not controlled, but curated CRM. I would say that it's absolutely uh, the in-use experience and the in-store experience, therefore, need to be managed. You're right, there is a huge ecosystem. That's in many ways our advantage. Every nook and corner of the country, uh, there is somebody who can mm, repair or service a Royal Enfield motorcycle. Uh, the fact of the matter is that some of the learnings and the trainings, because the motorcycles that we build are uh, evocative yet um, not extreme, uh, there, is, there is a strong degree of competence um, that already exists. Uh, we can do more to make sure that this competence continues in the in the years to come. But that competence already exists. There are tons and tons of corner ustads who only work on Enfields. They don't even look at any other motorcycle. Yeah. I think you're right. There is work to be done to make sure that the ecosystem continues to thrive in the years to come. And that's something we need to also look at beyond the 500 stores. So, you know, the, the last five years, maybe coinciding with the new improved Royal Enfield, we've seen a lot of international brands coming in. Yep. And there seems to be a market for even the high-end ones. So, who do you see as competition to you today? Look, uh, I think our genuine focus is on getting more people to understand the joy of riding a Royal Enfield uh, and what it does. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, brand situation to be in where you've got this fine tightrope between being aspirational yet accessible. We focus on making sure that that continues to be. Uh, I mean, I think everybody, all other brands around us, there's, there's enough headroom, I'm sure, for other brands to play uh, in their own segments. Our focus is to c continue to be as delightful for customers as we have been in the past and continue to find this, retain this balance between being aspirational yet accessible. The fact of the matter is that we produce purpose-built motorcycles which can do the on-road as much as it can go to the Himalayas, once in a while, if required. And that little tightrope that we've been able to manage to walk is the competitive advantage, if you like. We want to focus on that. We don't really look at making looking outside because there, there is enough opportunity to grow that segment. The mid-size segment, which is the 250cc to the 750cc, CC, broadly speaking, is what we would like to believe we operate in. Our job is to expand that segment. We are the undisputed leaders of that. We are probably 98% of that market. Having said that, uh, our job is not to continue to be a big uh, fish of a, in a small pond. The segment is expanding and our job for the next many decades will be to continue to expand that segment. So three to five years from now, how do you measure your success or your failure? That is Rudy's success or failure. But my job is uh, very clear. I don't know how simple it is, but it's very clear in my mind. Uh, we need to continue our momentum that we have in India. Uh, and the second part is to create many more Indias around the world. Around the world, And I think there is uh, that sweet spot that I talked about, this tightrope that we've been able to walk between being aspirational yet accessible. This opportunity exists in most parts of the developing and emerging world across the world. It also exists in markets like what we call the heritage markets like the UK and the US. We do believe that motorcycling has gone extreme in these markets. And there are people waiting to get into motorcycling, but there are no options. So really, my success would be about being able to expand the mid-size segment uh, and being the dominant player in it, in India and outside. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rudy. Thank you for talking to us. My pleasure.
Let's hope it's a smooth ride for Royal Enfield ahead. It's time for us to slip into a short break. When we come back, we speak to Under Considerations Armin Witt on the relevance of design for brands and importance of communicating this relevance to the clients.